A very good evening aspirants, welcome to Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankar A's Academy for the date 24th of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let us get into the article discussion. Today we are going to start our discussion with this front page news article. See the news article talks about the independence of election commissioner and the chief election commissioner. See suddenly the independence of the members of election commission came up because a petition was submitted to the supreme court regarding the functional independence of election commissioners. Now while hearing the petition the supreme court said that the election commissioner should be the one who could take a stand even risking his or her own life. And the article also said that a constitutional bench is examining various aspects such as the appointment of chief election commissioner and election commissioners, common procedure for the removal of the members of election commission and then even the rule making power, independent secretariat and budget for the election commission. And while doing so, the Supreme Court asked the government the mechanism through which it appointed Mr. Goyal as election commissioner. Now this is the crux of the news article given here. See here the Supreme Court is only examining various aspects. It has not given any order or directions. So we don't have to concentrate on the statements given by Supreme Court but instead we have to use this as an opportunity and revise again about the appointment and tenure of chief election commissioner and the election commissioners. Why do we have to do that? Since it is a news, there is a good probability that in prelims you may expect to question regarding appointment and tenure of the members of election commission. So with this note, let us see about the appointment. See whenever you think about the appointment of members of election commission, only one article has to come to your mind. That is article 324. See article 324 clause 1 says that there shall be a commission called election commission. We are not going to concentrate on that clause. See the clause of our interest here is clause 2. Article 324 clause 2 of the constitution talks about the composition of election commission. Firstly it says that the election commission shall consist of chief election commissioner and such number of other election commissioners fixed by the president. And secondly, it says that the appointment of the chief election commissioner and the election commissioners shall be made by the president. So these are the two important provisions given in clause 2. See, from this provisions, we have to make interpretation. So what interpretation can be made from these provisions? It can be said that the constitution has not prescribed the qualifications of members of election commission also, the constitution has not specified the term of members of the election commission and then the constitution has not debarred the retiring election commissioners from any further appointment by the government. See, why do we have to do this interpretation? Because in prelims, most of the times, UPSC will not ask direct statements from the articles. You might expect a statement like qualifications of the members of election commission are given in the constitution. At that time, you should know that that statement is incorrect. And for that purpose only, you have to do this interpretation, okay? Now, these are all interpreted regarding the appointment of members of election commission. Now, let us see the issue regarding it. Now, the issue here is that the appointment mechanism of the members of election commission is not clear. As I already said, qualifications are not mentioned in the constitution and the constitution has not prescribed the term of members. It simply said that president by rule will determine the conditions of service and tenure of office of election commissioners. And it also said that it is subjected to the provisions of parliamentary law. Now this brings us to the second issue. See, Article 324 Clause 2 envisages a parliamentary law for the purpose of appointment. Just now we saw that the conditions of service and tenure of members of election commission determined by president is also subjected to parliamentary law. Here, the issue is parliamentary law. Why it is an issue? Because no such law has been enacted so far regarding the appointment mechanism of the members of election commission. 
So these are all the two issues. And these only made the Supreme Court examine the various aspects of the Election Commission. See, as a solution for this, Supreme Court suggested an independent appointment committee for the appointment of members of Election Commission. And Justice Joseph called for the inclusion of Chief Justice of India in the appointment committee. And he said that this is to ensure the independence of Chief Election Commissioners and the Election Commissioners. Now, this is about the news article. See, so far we saw about the appointment of members of Election Commission. Now, let us see about the tenure. As per Article 324, the conditions of service and tenure of the members of Election Commission will be determined by the President by rule and it is subjected to parliamentary law. But the procedure that is followed is the Chief Election Commissioner and the Election Commissioners have a tenure of 6 years or they will give up their office if they attain 65 years of age and whichever is earlier. Now don't get confused here, I'll give you an example. Let us say the Chief Election Commissioner is appointed at the age of 64. At that time he will not have a tenure of 6 years because he is going to attain the age of 65 in 1 year of time. So his tenure is only one year and this is also pointed out by the Supreme Court and said that this is an issue because the centre is having a practice of appointing Chief Election Commissioner close to the age of 65 years of age. This is because conventionally the Chief Election Commissioners are appointed based on seniority from Election Commissioners. So obviously their age will be close to 65 years of age, right? And the issue pointed out by Supreme Court here is that they only have a brief tenure, right? And what can be done in such a short time? So to ensure the functional independence of Chief Election Commissioners and the Election Commissioners, Supreme Court is examining various aspects of Election Commission. See here, you don't have to remember all these issues and all. Regarding static, your takeaway from this discussion should be the number of members of election commission, who appoints them, what is the tenure and what is prescribed and what is not prescribed in the constitution. Try answering all of these questions. If you can answer each and every one of them, then you have revised fully about the appointment of members of election commission. While revising side by side, take note of everything and then revise it again in the future. See, the key to passing the UPSC examination is revision. So, revise it again and again. And that's all for this article discussion. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, for our next discussion, we are going to take this editorial article. See, this editorial article talks about the opportunities for India in its G20 presidency. See, since this article is written by an IAS officer, we are going to make note of all the important points mentioned in this particular article. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. Firstly, before seeing the points mentioned in the article, let us have a brief understanding of G20 and its working. As we all know, G20, which is expanded as group of 20, is a grouping of world's 20 largest economies. See, India is also a member of the grouping. Now, coming to its presidency, the presidency of G20 rotates every year among its members. And a unique thing about G20 presidency is that the country that holds the presidency works together with its predecessor and the successor. See, this grouping inside the G20 grouping is known as Troika. See, G20 have such an arrangement to ensure the continuity of the agenda. So, currently, Italy... Indonesia and India are the Troika countries. See, on November 16, Indonesian President officially handed over the G20 Presidency to India. And this happened at the end of Bali Summit. And India, it will officially assume the G20 Presidency from December 1, 2022. And this is about the Presidency of G20. Now, apart from this, know that G20 has no permanent secretariat. That is, the agenda and the work coordination is completed by G20 leaders, personal representatives, finance ministers and the central bank governors. And for your information, the G20 leaders, personal representatives, they are called as Sherpas. And like I said already, they work together with the finance ministers and the central bank governors to look after the agenda 
and work coordination. So in G20, the decision making happens only when all the 20 countries of the group give their consent on any major step. So what do we know from this? From this we know that the decision making is harder. But it is not impossible, okay? See, this G20 presidency is very important for India because the G20 members represent over 80% of world's GDP, 75% of international trade and 60% of the population. There are a few advantages or wins that are possible for India. Now, let us see them one by one. But before that, know some important facts. See, traditionally, the presiding country comes up with its own policy formulation. For example, the Italian presidency's agenda rested on three pillars. It is the people, planet and prosperity. And the Saudi presidency, it had also three objectives. It is nothing but empowering people, safeguarding the planet and shaping new frontiers. So now, India must also come up with a formulation that shows its true strengths to the world. Now with this information, let us move on to see the opportunities that are awaiting for India during its G20 presidency. See, firstly, the world currently needs new windows for financing climate infrastructure. On one hand, even countries like India, which are economically sound, need finances for investment in climate-related infrastructure. And on the other hand, international financial institutions like IMF, they have plenty of funds and they are looking for places to invest. So, using this G20 presidency, India can press the international financial institutions like IMF, World Bank and the Asian Development Bank to open new windows for financing the climate infrastructure. See, if such a thing happens, India can also use it to support its Panchamrit goals. Here, Panchamrit is nothing but the five nectar elements of India's climate action. See, in this image, you can see the five elements. So, to sum up, if India manages to persuade any of the international financial institutions to open a window for climate financing, it would be very significant. And this is the first opportunity that is in front of India. See, this is very important, right? Investing in climate infrastructure. We all know we are experiencing climate change and we are affected by its consequences. So, if India is able to achieve such a thing, then the countries in the world will understand India's strength. Secondly, India should use the G20 to roll out the India stack on global stage. Now, what is this India stack? See, India stack is nothing but a set of APIs that allows the governments, businesses, startups and developers to utilize a unique digital infrastructure to solve India's hard problems. Here, API is nothing but the application programming interface. See, it is a set of defined rules that explain how computers or applications communicate with one another. So, this API, it allows the governments and other institutions to utilize a unique digital infrastructure to solve India's problems towards presenceless, paperless and cashless service delivery. See, here, four distinct layers of India stack are given. You can go through it. See, this is only digital infrastructure. See, in this India stack, for example, take the presenceless layer. Here we have mobile ADA, ADA card. It is nothing but the unique digital biometric identity with open API access. In the paperless layer, we have DG locker. So hereafter, we don't have to carry papers anywhere. Now this cashless layer is UPI. We have used it several times, no? And consent layer is open personal data store. See, these stack allows the institutions to solve the India's hard problems. This is a digital infrastructure and these comes in handy, right? You don't have to face the problems of losing your documents or printing it out if you want to go to any government office and other such hardships. 
See, since India Stack is the world's largest digital public utility, Mr. Modi has often been asked in various global forums to share the design and implementation framework of India Stack. So, if India shares how this stack is developed, I mean, we are not going to share the personal data here. We are not going to send them the Aadhaar card details of the citizens. But we are going to share how it is developed. I mean, the design. And we can also teach them how to implement it. So, if India rolls out the India stack using the G20 as a platform, it will enable the country to be showcased on the global stage. See, this India stack would further enhance the India's prestige in the global forum. Now, this is the second opportunity that is in front of India. And thirdly, India could use the platform to push its own agenda and South Asia's agenda on a global scale. For example, India can come up with an alternative financial mechanism to SWIFT, which is a US monopoly. And it can also take baby steps for making the rupee more international. So, this is the third opportunity that is in front of India. See here, if you want to know more about SWIFT, no, you can watch our daily Hindu news analysis of February 28, 2022. Now, moving on to the fourth opportunity. See, India should use the G20 to redefine the shareholding structures of IMF and the World Bank. See, this must be done because the current structures of the World Bank and the IMF are at variance with the emerging world. See, this must be done because the current structures of the World Bank and the IMF are very different with the emerging world in general and India in particular. So, India can use the leadership to reimagine the shareholding structure in a way that it clearly reflects the global aspirations and the power position. And this is the fourth opportunity. And finally, India should use the G20 to showcase multiple and diverse aspects of its composite culture. This should be done because only then the rest of the world will know about the country's cultural richness. For example, Amitabh, the IAS officer who was a key driver of initiatives such as Incredible India and God's Own Country is now the G20 Sherpa. And by holding various G20 meetings in the top 25 destinations of India, it can power the tourism industry also. So, these are all the opportunities that India has to showcase itself in the global forum and elevate India's position in the global forum. So, the author concludes by saying that G20 is all about just one thing. Elevating India's position in the global arena as well as working for the progress of the world. So, it is time for India to win in the global stage. Now, that's all for this editorial article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about G20, its presidency, the policy formulation of previously presiding countries, and after that, we moved on to see about the opportunities that are in front of India during its G20 presidency. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the statement of the author. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, look at this article. See, it is a text and context article. And as the name suggests, this article is about El Nino and La Nina. See, these weather phenomena are again in the news because of a recent study. And according to this study, due to the climate change, the El Nino and La Nina weather patterns will be affected earlier than previously predicted. And how early? See, it was previously thought that climate change will impact El Nino and La Nina weather patterns by the year 2040. But the recent reports say that the climate change will significantly impact El Nino, La Nina weather patterns approximately by the year 2030 itself. That is, a decade earlier than the previously predicted year. And this is about the news article given here. Now, in this context, let us see what is El Nino, what is La Nina and what is Enzo. And finally, we will see about the recent study that is mentioned in the news article. But before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. To understand about El Nino event, we must make ourselves familiar with the condition along the Peru coast. 
that is in the eastern pacific during normal conditions now look at this map here this is the ocean current pattern during the normal years in this map the cold currents are highlighted by blue colored lines and the warm currents are highlighted in red colored lines now if you notice closely you can find a cold current near the peru coast it's here right and this is called as peru current so in a normal year the sea surface temperature in the eastern pacific is cold now before moving further let us take a quick detour and understand why there is a cold current along the peru coast see cold ocean currents are associated with the areas of upwelling now look at this image here see when there is offshore wind that is when the wind is blowing from land towards the ocean the wind pushes the water on the surface away from the coast so there will be a gap created along the coast right so to fill this gap cold water from the bottom rises up as you can see in this image and this water from the deep ocean is colder than the surrounding areas and this water will also be rich in nutrients and since water here is colder than the surrounding area it is called as cold ocean current so basically when there is offshore wind then the cold ocean current occurs now look at this map which highlights the trade winds if you can notice you can find the southeasterly trade winds along the western coast of south america see this is only south america and this is the western coast of south america and what is the direction of trade winds here it is south easterly and these south easterly trade winds are offshore winds so in the normal years there will be upwelling along the coast of peru which results in the cold peru current and during this normal condition there will be less rainfall along the coast of peru and normal rainfall along the coast of australia and indonesia see this is because as we all know it is the warm air that rises up and causes rainfall but as we saw along the coast of peru we have cold current and due to this the air will also be cold and we know that cold air will not rise up and there will not be rainfall along the coast of peru see the world's driest place the atacama desert in chile is due to the presence of peru cold current see now here you may think it is unfortunate right but actually the lack of rainfall is actually a boon for peru this is because as we saw upwelling brings lots of nutrients to the surface so the planktons they feed on the nutrients and the fishes they feed on the planktons so the peru coast makes a rich fishing ground and this is due to the cold current and the lack of rainfall and this is the condition during normal years now what happens during the el nino years see we know that we have cold peru current due to the presence of offshore winds along the peru coast see this offshore wind is due to the southeasterly trade winds and during the el nino years the trade winds weaken and in turn weakening the offshore winds so the upwelling that normally happens along the peru coast will not happen and this results in making the sea surface temperature in the central eastern tropical pacific ocean substantially higher than normal conditions in other words a warm ocean current temporarily replaces the cold peruvian current see this warm current starts flowing during the christmas and therefore baby christ was the name given to this event el nino is a spanish word meaning the child and it refers to the baby christ now look at this map here during the el nino event the water along the coast of peru becomes warmer and the water along the coast of australia becomes colder and due to this during the el nino years there will be increased rainfall in peru and drought like conditions along the australian coast so basically el nino affects the fishing economy along the coast of peru and also causes forest fires in australia by creating drought like conditions there now apart from this el nino also impacts the indian monsoon 
See, during the El Nino event, there will be a weak rainfall and more heat in India. Now, this is about El Nino. Now, coming to La Nina. See, La Nina in Spanish means the girl. And it is the exact opposite of El Nino. During a La Nina event, the southeasterly trade winds strengthen. And due to this, the offshore winds along the Peruvian coast strengthens, which in turn results in excessive upwelling. And due to this, the sea surface temperature in the central and eastern tropical Pacific Ocean, that is along the Peru coast, becomes lower than normal. And at the same time, the sea surface temperature along the coast of Australia becomes warmer than normal. So, during the La Nina years, the Peru coast will receive lesser than normal rainfall and at the same time, in Australia and Indonesia, there will be floods due to excessive rainfall. Actually, two successive La Nina events in the last two years caused intensive flooding in Australia, resulting in significant damage. See, like El Nino, La Nina event also affects the Indian monsoon. See, during the La Nina years, the trade winds that fuel the Indian monsoon intensify. And this results in higher than normal rainfall in India during the La Nina years. Now, let us move on to see about Enzo, which is nothing but El Nino Southern Oscillation. See, we all know that the temperature on the surface influences the air pressure. See, in areas where the surface is cold, the air becomes cold. And since cold air is heavier, it starts sinking. And as air starts sinking, the pressure in the area increases. So, basically, the areas where the surface is cold will have high pressure conditions. And the inverse happens in areas where the surface temperature is warm. In these areas, the air becomes warmer because the surface temperature is warm and the air starts rising up. And due to this, these areas are associated with low pressure conditions. See, during the years of El Nino events, the sea surface temperature changes, right? And due to this change in temperature, the air pressure pattern also changes. And this is called as sudden oscillation. And since this change in air pressure pattern happens during the El Nino events, it is called as El Nino Southern Oscillation. See, basically, El Nino and La Nina talks about sea surface temperature and the Enzo, that is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, talks about the pressure pattern or the air circulation. Now, look at this image to understand the change in pressure patterns and air circulation that happens during El Nino and La Nina events. See, during El Nino, the warmer air rises along the Peruvian coast. And during La Nina, we saw that the Australian coast will have warm sea surface temperature, right? So, here only the air is rising up. And these change in pressure patterns and air circulation is called as El Nino Southern Oscillation. See, in this image, this neutral pattern is the normal condition. Now, coming back to the article, as I already mentioned, this article talks about a study published in Nature magazine. And according to the study, due to climate change, El Nino and La Nina events will be affected. And this in turn will affect the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Since the ENSO, that is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, influences the global climate, the climate change impact on ENSO might result in affecting the entire global climate pattern. Now, that is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the normal conditions that exist in Peruvian coast and the reason for cold current that occurs along the Peruvian coast and we saw about the El Nino event and the impact of El Nino event and after that we saw about the La Nina event and the impact of La Nina event and we saw about ENSO which is nothing but the El Nino Southern Oscillation. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing a study that was published in Nature magazine. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, have a look at this news article. This news article says that India and the Gulf Cooperation Council will announce the beginning of negotiations for a free trade agreement. 
See, the pact aims at promoting two-way commerce and investments between the regions. And this is the crux of the news article given here. And in this context, let us discuss about Gulf Cooperation Council briefly. See, the Gulf Cooperation Council, or shortly referred as GCC, was established by an agreement which was concluded in the year 1981. And this agreement was between Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. See, this agreement was in the view of their special relations, geographic proximity, similar political systems which was based on Islamic beliefs, joint destiny and common objectives. And know that the official language of Gulf Cooperation Council is Arabic. Now, these are all the basic information of GCC. Now, coming to the objectives of GCC, see its basic objectives are to promote coordination integration and interconnection between member states in all fields in order to achieve unity between them. And this is the first objective. Secondly, it aspires to deepen and strengthen the relations, links and areas of cooperation now prevailing between their people in various fields. See, the first one is to promote the coordination and integration. And the second one is to deepen the areas of cooperation. And thirdly, its objective is to formulate similar regulations in various fields such as economic and financial affairs, commerce, customs and communications, education and culture. And finally, its objective is to stimulate scientific and technological progress in the fields of industry, mining, agriculture, water and animal resources. And it also aspects to establish scientific research, to establish joint ventures and encourage cooperation by the private sector for the good of their people. So basically the final objective is to progress scientifically and technologically. Now these are all the objectives of Gulf Cooperation Council. Now coming to the important part, the significance of GCC for India. Firstly, we'll see about the political significance. See the governments of the Gulf Cooperation Council members they are India friendly. See, it's not like we don't have any disagreements. We have disagreements and agreements, but it's not like the relationship that we have with Pakistan. And that is what I mean by India friendly. Okay. And that is the first significance. Secondly, we'll see about the economic significance. See, the Gulf Cooperation Council states are among India's key suppliers of energy and annual remittances. See, the annual remittances from Indians in the Gulf Cooperation Council countries are worth $4.8 billion. And also know that the total bilateral trade of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries with the India, it grew from $87.35 billion in the year 2020-21 to $154.66 billion in the year 2021-22. See, it is a significant growth, right? And that is exactly why we say the Gulf Cooperation Council is economically significant for India. Now, thirdly, take security aspect. See, both India and the Gulf Cooperation Council, they are members of the Financial Action Task Force. Now, if you want to know more about Financial Action Task Force, watch the October 30, 2022 analysis. We have covered it elaborately there. And apart from this, the Saudi Arabia, Oman, Kuwait and others participate in India's mega multilateral Milan exercise. See, Milan is nothing but a biennial multilateral naval exercise organized by Indian Navy. And this is the second cooperation in terms of security. And other than this, India also has bilateral exercises with most of the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. Now comment if you know any bilateral exercises between India and any Gulf country, okay? Now these are all the security perspective of significances for India. Now finally, let us see the energy security. See, Gulf Cooperation Council, it is very important for India because for India's energy security, we depend on the Gulf Cooperation Council. See, according to the Union Ministry's Petroleum Planning and Analysis Cell Report, India imported 212.2 million tonnes of crude oil in the year 2021-22 to 22 
from 42 different countries. And most of the oil that India received during this period was from the Gulf countries. And among the Gulf countries, Iraq is the largest exporter. See, it exported 22% of India's oil requirement. And Iraq was followed by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And Kuwait too is emerging as one of the major oil exporters to India. Now, these are all the significances of GCC to India. And with this, we have also come to the end of this particular discussion. In this discussion, we saw about some basics of Gulf Cooperation Council. We saw about its objectives. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the significance of Gulf Cooperation Council for India. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, look at this article here. This news article says that more than 270 members of Kuki Chin community entered into Mizoram. See, these people, they are from Bangladesh. And they were allowed to enter India on humanitarian grounds. See, they were referred as officially displaced persons in the state government records. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us discuss about Kukichin community and why they are migrating to Mizoram. See, Kukichin community is a Christian community. They are from Bangladesh, Chittagong Hill Tracks. See, they share close ethnic ties with people in Mizoram. Their main profession is Zoom farming, that is slash and burn shifting cultivation. They produce cotton, ginger, pumpkin, chilies, turmeric, tobacco and many other vegetables. See, these people, they like to live deep in the jungle. And they build their houses on top of hills. And their houses are made of wood, bamboo, straw and tin. See, most of the people in this community are illiterate. They speak Kumi language, that is their language. And these people are called as Kumi people. And their second language is Marma. And many of them can also speak some local Chittagonian. Now, these are some facts about the Kukichin community. Now, why are they seeking refuge in India? See, it is because of the action of Bangladesh Rapid Action Battalion against the insurgent Kukichin National Army. See, the KNA, that is the Kukichin National Army, is also known as Kukichin National Front. And it is a militant outfit. See, they are demanding sovereignty for the tribals. And the security forces of Bangladesh decided to take action after the group, that is the Kuki Chin National Front, allegedly made an agreement with the radical Islamist group. So, this is the reason why they are let into India based on humanitarian grounds. Now, apart from this, also know that Bangladesh Chittagong Hill Tracks, they are home to a dozen of Buddhist and Christian ethnic groups collectively known as Juma people. And the emergence of Kuki Chin National Front and its alleged linkages with an Islamist group has added another layer of complexity. And these are the reasons cited by the Bangladesh security forces for the action taken against them. Now, that's all for this article discussion. In this article discussion, we saw about Kukichin community, their characteristics and features and why they are migrating from Bangladesh. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, for our next discussion, we are going to take this news article. The news article says that ISRO will launch Earth Observation Satellite 06 and 8 nano satellites on November 26. See, the launch vehicle to be used is PSLV C-54. ISRO said that the PSLV C-54 will launch EOS-6 and 8 nano satellites into two different sun-synchronous polar orbits. See, EOS here is expanded as Earth Observation Satellite. And this is about the news article given here. In this context, let us see about Earth Observation Satellites and why they are launched in sun-synchronous polar orbits. And finally, we'll see some of its applications also. First of all, what are Earth Observation Satellites? As the name suggests, these satellites are used to observe the Earth. To be more specific, these satellites observe the Earth from space. 
But why are they placed in sun synchronous polar orbits? See, we all know what is polar orbit, right? See, satellites in polar orbits usually travel past Earth from the north to south direction, which means it will pass over the Earth poles. See, Earth it rotates from west to east direction. But the satellites that are placed in polar orbits, they travel past Earth from north to south direction. Here you have to understand that satellites in a polar orbit do not have to pass through north and south pole precisely. See, it means that it need not have to exactly pass through the north and south pole. Even a deviation within 20 to 30 degrees is still classified as polar orbit. See, polar orbits are a type of low earth orbits. Why it is a type of low earth orbit? Because they are at low altitudes between 200 to 1000 km. Now, this is about the polar orbits. Now, what is sun synchronous polar orbit? See, sun synchronous orbit is a particular kind of polar orbit. Satellites in sun synchronous orbit traveling over the polar regions are synchronous with the sun. This means that they are synchronized to be always in the same fixed position relative to the sun. So, it revolves around the earth relative to the sun. This means that the satellite always visits the same spot at the same local time. Now, how is this sun synchronous polar orbit different from geostationary orbit? We will understand this with an example. For instance, say two satellites are placed over Chennai. One is placed in geostationary orbit, the other one is placed in sun synchronous polar orbit. Now here, the satellite placed in the sun synchronous polar orbit will appear above Chennai at the same time every day. That is, every day at 2 pm, the satellite placed in the sun synchronous polar orbit will appear above Chennai. See here, I am just randomly saying 2 pm. It does not mean that the Earth observation satellites that are placed in the sun synchronous polar orbit appear above Chennai at 2 p.m. only. No, it's not right. It's not a fact. I'm just randomly saying it for your understanding. Assume that a satellite is placed over Chennai and this satellite will appear above Chennai every day at 2 p.m. And this is only the satellite that is placed in the sun synchronous polar orbit. But the satellite that is placed in the geostationary orbit, it will always appear above the Chennai. It's not like it will visit at the same time every day. No, it appears always above the Chennai. And this is the difference between the satellites that are placed in sun synchronous polar orbit and geostationary orbit. And here note that like the polar orbit, sun synchronous orbits, they are also medium or low orbits. A satellite in sun synchronous orbit would usually be at an altitude of between 600 to 800 km. See, since satellites placed in sun synchronous polar orbit always visit the same spot at the same local time, these satellites will always observe a point on Earth at the same time every day. And this is what makes the sun synchronous polar orbit useful for remote sensing. See, using satellites placed in sun synchronous polar orbits, scientists can analyze a particular area by taking a series of images of same areas at a particular time across many days, weeks, months or even years. For example, if meteorologists want to observe the cloud pattern over Delhi at 2 pm every day, over the period of one year, it is the sun synchronous polar orbit that comes to their aid. And the other application of sun synchronous polar orbit is in regards to spy satellites. See, spy satellites are also placed in sun synchronous polar orbits. Now, take a look at this image here. This image shows the Galvan Valley at two different periods. One on June 28, 2020 and the other one on July 6, 2020. Like this, to take images and make a comparative analysis, Satellites must be placed in sun synchronous polar orbits. See, since Earth observation satellites needs to observe the changes in Earth and Earth's atmosphere, they are placed in sun synchronous polar orbits. I hope you understand why 
the Earth observation satellites are placed in sun synchronous polar orbits. Now with this information let us move on to see the applications of Earth observation satellites. See the Earth observation satellites finds application in environmental monitoring, meteorology, cartography. And these satellites provide essential information on a vast number of areas including ocean salinity, ice thickness, crop health and air quality. Now that's all regarding this article discussion. In this discussion we saw about earth observation satellites, we saw about polar orbit and after that we saw about sun synchronous orbits and we saw the reason why earth observation satellites are placed in sun synchronous polar orbits and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the applications of earth observation satellites. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion. Now for our final discussion we are going to take this news article. See this news article talks about the terrorist and disruptive activities act quote which is shortly referred as TADA quote. Yesterday the TADA court in Jammu issued a fresh protection warrant against the JKLF chief and this is done because he again refused to cross examine the witnesses virtually in a case related to the killing of four Indian Air Force officials in Srinagar in 1990. And in this backdrop let us understand about the TADA court. Firstly, TADA stands for Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Prevention Act 1985. It is an anti-terrorist law to prevent the terrorist and disruptive activities. See, this law came into force under the insurgency of Punjab and it was applicable for the entire country of India. Remember, it was the first anti-terror act applied by the government to oppose the terrorist activities. See, the important thing that you have to note here is that TADA Act was cancelled and it was replaced by Prevention of Terrorist Activities Act 2000 to 2004. This means that it was implemented for this period only and it got cancelled after some controversies. Now moving on, let us understand some of the powers given by the TADA Act. See, under the Act, the law enforcement agencies have been given significant powers to deal with the national terrorism and disruptive activities. See, the police were allowed to present a detainee within 24 hours in front of a judicial magistrate. And the judicial court considers the evidence for the accusations and gives out judgments for the accused person under the Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Prevention Act 1985. Now this is about the powers given by TADA Act. Moving on, let us understand about the courts for TADA Act. See the designated courts for the jurisdiction of terrorist activities in particular areas will be decided by the central government and the state government of India. And the judge who is in charge of the designated courts will be appointed by centre government in case of state government, the judge will be appointed by the state government in consultation with the Chief Justice of High Court. See, any terrorist or disruptive activities are to be punished by the appointed judge of the designated court. And they have all the right to punish the accused under this act. See, the central government and in some cases, the state government can also appoint a public prosecutor or an additional public prosecutor or special public prosecutor for every designated courts. And regarding this court only, we saw in the news article today. Now this is all you have to know about the court that is for the TADA Act. Now that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about TADA Act, the powers given by the TADA Act and the designated courts. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. Today we have 6 prelims questions. I will solve 5 of them and one of them is a quiz question for you. Now let us take this first question. Consider the following statements. Statement 1. Removal procedure of Chief Election Commissioner is similar to the removal procedure of Supreme Court Judge. See this statement is correct. You all know what is the removal procedure of Supreme Court, right? So here, the Chief Election Commissioner, he can be only removed by President on the basis of a resolution passed by both the Houses of Parliament. 
and it has to be passed with special majority and the grounds for removal is either proved misbehavior or incapacity so this means that the chief election commissioner does not hold office at the pleasure of president though he is appointed by the president now coming to second statement election commissioners can be removed by recommendations of the chief election commissioner see this statement is also correct election commissioners and other regional commissioners they can be removed based on the recommendations of chief election commissioner so both of the statements are correct so the correct answer here is option c both 1 and 2 now moving on to the second question consider the following statements regarding to la nina event during la nina event there will be low pressure conditions along the peruvian coast see this statement is entirely wrong it is because during la nina event there will be amplified upwelling along the peruvian coast and due to this the peru current will be colder than normal and due to the presence of cold current air will also become colder and it starts sinking resulting in high pressure condition this we saw in our discussion itself now coming to second statement la nina event has no effect on indian monsoon the statement is also incorrect we saw in our discussion that both el nino and la nina event impact the indian monsoon during la nina event india will receive more rainfall than usual now moving on to the third statement la nina event is characterized by unusually cold ocean temperature along the coast of australia see if we know statement 1 is incorrect then you can surely say that statement 3 is also incorrect see statement 3 says that coast of australia will have cold ocean temperature just now we saw that peruvian coast will only have colder temperature during la nina so this statement is incorrect see la nina event is characterized by unusually warm ocean temperature along the coast of australia and this results in low pressure condition which eventually results in more rainfall for australia so what did we find out here we found out that three statements are incorrect in this question so what has the question asked it has asked for the incorrect statements so the correct answer to this question is option d 1 2 and 3 now moving on to the next question which among the following countries are members of gulf cooperation council bahrain qatar united arab emirates iran saudi arabia and oman see among these countries only one is incorrect have you all found out what it is exactly Iran is not a member of Gulf Cooperation Council. See Gulf Cooperation Council is a union of 6 countries. It includes Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman and Bahrain. So the correct answer to this question is option C 1 2 3 5 and 6 only. Now moving on to the next question consider the following pairs regarding refugees and the respective countries Rohingya Myanmar Kukichin Bangladesh Maldives Nepal see if you are a person who is following current affairs regularly you all know all of these pairs are correct so the correct answer to this question is option C all three pairs now moving on to the next question which among the following are earth observation satellites cartosat insat oceansat saral resource sat see cartosat it is one of the india's earth observation satellite its application is mainly towards cartography in india that is maps and oceansat it is also a part of india's earth observation satellites it is mainly built for ocean related application and saral it is a joint program between india's isro and france's cnes and it finds its application mainly in marine meteorology and resource sat it is the earth observation remote sensing satellite it will gather information on land water bodies forests farm lands coastal information mineral deposits rural and urban spreads and it will also aid in disaster management and what did i leave out i left out the insat right it is because it is not an earth observation satellite it is a telecommunication satellite so this is only the odd one out here if we find out that two is not going to be in the answer then the correct answer is option a 1 3 4 and 5 only now moving on to the next question aspirants this is only the quiz question for you 
think about it and post your answer in the comment section aspirants i have displayed a mains question here for you so interested people write it and post your answer in the comment section if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today post that also in the comment section and with this we have come to the end if you find the video useful like share and comment and do subscribe to shankar as academy's youtube channel for further updates thank you